Hello, and welcome back to Jacksonville University and OSERT Virtual Marine Science Camp. Today's theme is all about careers that relate to the marine environment and potentially some jobs that um, are available to you that you might not know exist. And so we're going to talk to people from these various backgrounds and figure out how they got these jobs and what their current jobs entail. Um, we are going to have uh, Jill Christofferson from Florida Fish and Wildlife this morning, um, Tom Martin, uh, who's retired from the Army Corps of Engineers, Lena Schulze, who is our physical oceanographer at Jacksonville University. And to kick things off, we have Dan Smith, who is the Director of Sustainability at Crowley. And so without further ado, I'm gonna switch over to Dan. And um, don't forget, if you are interested in seeing any of the prior um, sessions that we had this week, those are available online. And we also encourage donations if you're able to. Hi, Dan, welcome, how are you? Uh, I'm doing okay, thanks for having me, Melinda. Where are you talking to us from? I am based in uh, Seattle, Washington, so I'm talking from my second bedroom slash home office here, which has been my office office for several months now in and around this COVID crisis. It's strange, isn't it? Uh, it is. It's it, uh, it's a challenge for many, but uh, it's it's worked well for me actually. I haven't minded uh, I haven't minded the remote work at all. <laughs> the commute is not something that I miss, and I guess. You know, I, I feel, though, for my colleagues who have young children at home who they're trying to raise at the same time that they're doing a 40, 60, 80 hour a week job. That gets tricky for sure. So, yeah. Dan, can you tell us a bit about what your job as director of sustainability involves and, and how you got to that position? Sure. Yeah, you bet. So at a real high level, my job is to assist uh, Crowley's operating entities and there are four of them. Uh, one that focuses on fuels, one on shipping, one on logistics, and one on government services. So, so to help all those operational functions, those verticals, identify and manage their most pressing environmental, social, and governance issues for their businesses. Awesome. So that's that's really the day to day um, uh, for much of my work. And so, how did you how did you get to that position? What sort of degrees do you need? Sure. So this is a path that when I started on it was less defined than I think it is now. Um, there are now undergraduate and graduate programs focused directly on sustainability. And that was less of a thing uh, when I was going through my schooling. Uh, so I really came through a, uh, a background in marine science and policy. I did undergraduate studies at UC Davis and really actually did an individual major that I defied with uh, faculty advisors there on maritime science and policy. Took a few years and worked in the construction industry and then went back for my master's degree at Oregon State University in um, marine resource management. So I took the environmental science and policy focused on the coastal and ocean environment um, route to, to get me here. It was a winding path. So if somebody wanted a similar position, is that the route that you would recommend they take? Or are there other degrees that you think they that could have wound them or landed them in the same position you are? Sure, sure. Um, I think there, there are many different approaches. I uh, don't necessarily use the, the, the hardcore studies I did in biological oceanography, G, um, um, geological oceanography, physical oceanography in my day to day to day. But I do think that going through those science based courses kind of helped me understand how to think about problems and just how to think in general. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't advise people against uh, a science based uh, path if they're interested in, in coming into this industry. At the same time, there are now sustainability focused degree programs um, that really give students more of an emphasis on, I think the communication side and, and working with, with people and, and moving messages and helping uh, steward change in organizations. And those are skills that I got less of with the harder science background um, that, that I've had to learn on the way. Okay. So short answer to your question is it is it goes all ways as corny as it says as it sounds I'd say follow your passion if you're into the science stuff mm -hmm. um, go for it that doesn't preclude you at all from 
from getting a job in this industry and the ability to think about the problems that we face um, from a solid, rigorous, science-based background, I think is something that I'd encourage a lot of people to go for. Excellent. So can you tell us a bit about um, some of the steps that Crowley is taking to be more sustainable? I, you, you touched a bit on the things, parts of your job, but are there new fuels that are being used? What's the most exciting sure. thing that you like feel as promised right now? Yeah, so the company is doing a, a lot of work in this space. As, as some people in the Jacksonville area may know, um, we've deployed to uh, liquid natural gas that is effectively methane propelled container roll-on roll-off ships in the Puerto Rico trade. Um, so that's been revolutionary and was really a lot of innovative work from the design side. There are really unique ships that went into that. Uh, and those ships by burning LNG are uh, significantly contributing to reductions in sulfur oxide emissions uh, in U.S. coastal waters effectively. So I just LNG learned, is, yeah, I just learned about LNG last week. I had never heard that before, and people in shipping are throwing that around left and right now. I think in total in Jacksonville, we have four ships and two are Crowleys, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of our competitors in the trade also has has ships running on that fuel, and the the real driver for the LNG ships is um, to meet sulfur emissions uh, requirements. So. Uh, their international and frankly domestic requirements around the amount of sulfur that can be emitted from from ships and trade and LNG as an energy source has has very little all negligible amounts of sulfur contains negligible amounts of sulfur so and am, am I correct and I think I recall that if there was I mean you guys are very cautious but if there was any sort of leak with LNG it's not like an oil spill right doesn't it evaporate <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. So um, the risks around LNG are different than those around traditional fuel oils and our engineering teams and those of our partners who are bringing the LNG to um, to the terminal in Jacksonville where we fuel the ships have put in years of work um, to make sure that they can do so safely. So LNG is a, is a fuel source is new uh, for, for our fleet and it's really not achieved a lot of saturation in global fleets. That's, uh, that's something that we've got uh, going on now. And of course, uh, as we look towards a zero emissions shipping future in the not too distant future, um, uh, I think we're gonna have to be looking at other energy sources as well to move ships uh, on the world's oceans, so. Do you think things like solar or, or what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, so the challenge when we look at the deep sea fleet uh, is that these ships have to go thousands of miles without the opportunity to refuel. So right now, I don't see that batteries um, as as charged by solar cells are going to provide enough energy to move an ocean going ship across the Atlantic or Pacific. In the coastal trades or looking at ferries, there's a lot more promise there. In fact, uh, here in Washington state, uh, the state's undertaking a program to uh, shift their ferry system and we have a robust ferry system here with all the islands mm -hmm. in and around seattle um, to hybrid electric so i see electric and battery propulsion as really a big driver in the coastal and the short sea um, shipping context but when we go to deep sea the, the jury is still out. Some leading contenders are hydrogen and ammonia as fuel sources uh, for deep sea transportation. Ammonia, that's interesting. I haven't heard of that. Yeah. Huh. In, in, in H3, there's no carbon. If you can generate ammonia using renewable energy, um, mm -hmm. you can literally have no carbon footprint. I mean, there's not a carbon molecule in in ammonia so there's promise there but technologically we we're not yet uh there on burning ammonia or liquid hydrogen or gaseous hydrogen for that matter in the deep sea trades Interesting. with time it, it's an exciting time in 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 that regard yeah very cool so do you think there might be a possibility of using um solar and um and uh lng combined <laughs> Sure. So, I mean, those kinds of uh, novel applications, I know of certain roll-on, roll-off ships, which have 
uh, a lot of their big enclosed car carries are effectively. So they have a lot of sale area, their big boxes. Row they rows, have, right? Uh, Affectionately yeah, called. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The row rows. There are some row row ships uh, that I believe have been outfitted with solar panels. Uh, and the, the electricity generated from those panels can provide um, energy for some of the hotel loads on the ships. Also, um, there's, interestingly enough, there have been uh, a, a renewed interest, I'll say, in wind as an energy source. Uh, huh. Merce Tankers has tried a system called a Fletner rotor. It's effectively a big cylinder on the top of some of, uh, some of their shuttle tankers, or at least one of their shuttle tankers that generates energy to help propel the ship or for hotel loads when uh, the winds are correct. There are kites for ships. Um, kites? So there are all kinds, yeah, kites uh, that would effectively drag the ship if you're running down wind. So there are these alternate applications that can supplement um, the energy that is uh, that is generated on board a ship to make it work. Flattener rotors aren't gonna work for container ships because you need to have containers on deck, but if you have a bulk ship, or tanker, which has a flat deck, they could work. And so what's gonna, the solution is gonna depend on the trade um, and the ship, uh, but it is exciting to see some of these things come into market and us in some ways returning to wind, I mean, going full circle on on energy for moving ships. <laughs> like the days of old with the sailing ships. So someone yeah, yeah. asked, what if you used solar power during the day and then electrical during night? Sure. No. So that's uh, the the questioner was on target there. What we're talking about, though, uh, and the reason that solar alone is a challenge for the deep sea is these are just these are really big power plants. There's a lot of energy that needs to go into uh, moving these ships. Um, You can't see my house, the size of my house, but some of the engines and the ocean going vessels are literally house sized um, and we're moving thousands or tens of thousands of containers so although ocean transport is on a ton mile basis the most efficient uh, mode of transport that we've got uh, compared to railroad and air uh, we're still talking about enormous amounts of energy and there's just not enough energy with current technology that you can get from solar panels that would fit on a ship to, to move that ship Okay, so we're we're running low on time. We're trying to do 15 minutes per person this morning, but can you just sure, walk sure. me through some of the things that you do through an average day? Yeah, yeah, you bet. So today when I get off the phone with you guys, I'll be going into a meeting to talk about some environmental liabilities that, uh, that the company has incurred associated with historical operations. Not anything bad that we did, but operations were different years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be attending a a site down on the Duwamish Waterway uh, where we historically conducted operations. And I'd have to pull up my Outlook calendar to see what else is going on. I'll probably be meeting with one of my team members around emissions monitoring and tracking uh, for our facilities. That is our electrical usage as part of our um, scope two greenhouse gas emissions footprint. And that's today. I mean, any given day, there's a whole host of things uh, from attending vessels to marine cargo terminals, to staring at the computer, to being on policy calls with regulators, to working with customers on helping them address their sustainability issues. It's a whole range of stuff. And that is one thing I've appreciated about the job. You get to use a lot of different skills. Well, thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate you uh, volunteering your time today to um, be with us and tell us about your job and Crowley. And um, I wish you well. Yeah, I appreciate you hosting this. Thanks so much for for having me, Melinda. Take care and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Bye, Dan. Bye. Okay, let's see if Dr. Schultz is on. Lena, are you there? I am here. I can't see you. Can you turn your video on? It's working on it. There you are. Oh, it's good Uh, to see you. I've missed you. I know. I missed you too. So Dr. Schultze and I work down the hallway from each other in the Marine Science Research Institute at Jacksonville University under normal circumstances. (laughs) And uh, Dr. Schultze is a physical oceanographer. Can you talk us to... uh, Words are hard. Can you talk to us about your degrees, Lena, and um, 
why you got interested in physical oceanography and then after that maybe we'll talk about what a physical oceanographer does sure um so i started with a bachelor's in meteorology and oceanography so i was interested in weather and ocean and i thought i was going to be a meteorologist so i was going to predict the weather um tell all of you what you know sunny or rainy tomorrow and so on and then i um during my degree i got interested in the ocean and did an internship in one of the biggest oceanography institutes in the states and so i got interested in the ocean so after my bachelor's i w did a or i worked on a phd in oceanography um and concentrated fully on the ocean and so my my area of interest is physical oceanography so um you were born in germany uh, yes and then where did you do your bachelor's so i went to school in england um i did my bachelor's at the university of east anglia which nobody knows where that is but that's okay <laughs> um if you go from london to cambridge you go a little bit further you get to norwich which is where uea is um, and then i did my phd at the university of southampton which is also in the uk okay and then you also spent some time at florida state didn't you so after my PhD, I started working as a scientist um, at FSU, uh, where I worked with one of very big name in physical oceanography. Um, so I got to work with him for two and a half years in um, Tallahassee at FSU. And then I came to JNU after that. <laughs> okay, and while, correct me if I'm wrong here, this is fun because I get to learn, I'm yes, learning some I'm new stuff. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I had Jeremy Stalker, Dr. Stalker, on on Monday, and um, we learned about drifters. And um, he brought up your deep water drifters. So I think while you were at FSU, you helped have those built, right? And you're one of the few people that has deep water drifters? Yes, that's right. So um, it's very hard to observe the bottom of the ocean. It's just very far away from where we humans usually are. And it's very difficult to send any instrumentation down there because once it's down there, we can't control it. And the bottom is dangerous. We don't want anything to crash. So while I was at FSU, we developed a drifter that goes to the bottom of the ocean and just follows the ocean, the ocean bottom um, and drifts with the currents. And while it does that, it measures uh, temperatures. It measures how fast the water is going. Um, and it can measure all sorts of other things as well. And there's currently four existing ones and three of them, I wanna say they're mine, they're not technically mine, they belong to FSU, but three of them are the ones that I developed, helped develop and um, they were already built, but I you know, I made sure that they you, would you die made them better. that they come back to me. I'm going to pause for one second. We're getting some questions because sometimes people join a little late and people are wondering what we're learning. Know, sorry. People are wondering what we're learning. What we're learning sorry, today. What we're learning today. So today is all about careers in marine science. Um, and not even necessarily all of them have to be science, but careers related to the marine environment. And so we are bringing on speakers from several different backgrounds and finding out how they got to where they are in case these careers seem to appeal to you and you would like to do something similar. We're also gonna ask them what their career is like so that um, we figure out whether you think it's a correct fit for you or not. Okay, so to get back to what you were saying, Dr. Schultze, you mentioned you don't want them to crash. And I think that perhaps some of our viewers might not understand about seafloor bathymetry. Like, I think a lot of people think it's just flat. Yeah. So can you explain what you meant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these drifters specifically, they go into shallower regions, so the coast. And the coast is not just flat bottom, sandy bottom. It actually has big rocks, it has canyons, it has some mounds um, and the topography. So what the bottom looks like is actually really similar to what you see on land. So if you see mountains on land, you will see those mountains down below the water as well. And so it's pretty difficult to actually have anything follow that. It's like trying to fly an airplane really close to the um, surface of earth and make it follow these mountains. And so that's exactly what this instrument is trying to do. How do you control that? Like, are you driving it from, how do you keep it just so? Yeah, <laughs> so I don't, once it's underwater, I have no control over it. It's actually really stressful. 
put them in the water. Because once they're under the water, they do their own thing. And the way it um, controls what it does, it has a little computer inside, and that computer measures how far away it is from the bottom. And so it can calculate, oh, I'm four meters away, and oh, I need to be a little bit further away. So it makes itself a little bit lighter, or it makes itself a little bit uh, more dense and heavier to go up or down in the water column. That so is it's so just cool. a very um, smart little computer program that controls that. So you, how many so times have you been to Antarctica? <laughs> so yes, my the, the bottom drift was the one of my interests. And then my other interest is um, things that happen in Antarctica and the Arctic. And so currently I'm working on a project in Antarctica and I actually have only been there, I say only, I've been there twice. However, I have never set foot onto the continent of Antarctica <laughs> because usually I am there on a ship, on the coastline and I can see it, but I can't touch it. So technically I've been to Antarctica exactly zero times, but I've been <laughs> in the ocean in front of Antarctica um, twice. <laughs> and you've sent Jacksonville University students down there twice, right? Yes. Two different students? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I took two of my master's students. Um, one of them went with me two years, two and a half years ago now, one and a half year ago, 2018, 2019. And the other one was just down there this past winter. Um, and both of them helped me collect data um, and water samples while they were down there. What an amazing yeah. opportunity. That's really incredible. Yes. And the second student actually got to walk on Antarctica. So I'm a little jealous that she got to go and I didn't. I wonder <laughs> if she's the first JU affiliate that set foot on Antarctica. She could be. Yeah. Probably. Probably. So going to Antarctica sounds really exciting. To some people, the idea of going out on cruises is really exciting. A lot of your work, however, is computer based, right? It is. So yes. can you like you do a ton of computer coding, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that those of us that mainly use Excel, we're, we're so old fashioned, you're all in MATLAB <laughs> and R, right? Yeah. For those yes. people out there. So, yeah, so once I get all this data, it's usually so much data that Excel just doesn't, is not able to um, analyze all that data, or at least not fast enough. It's very complicated in Excel. So we use pro computer programs and not everybody has heard of them. Um, one that's called MATLAB, which is very big in oceanography and um, engineering. A lot of engineers use it. Um, and with that, we are able to just much faster do a lot of calculations. We wanna know how fast the water is going. So we have to calculate that. How much heat is in the water? Or we can calculate that really fast. Those kind of things. So um, I go to see maybe once every three years and the rest of the time I'm looking at data, I'm making figures, I'm trying to explain what I'm seeing in the data and that's all computer based mainly. Yeah. And do you make models? I do not. Okay. Um, so there are people in physical oceanography that built models and with that, you know, we mean that they kind of try to predict what the water will do mm -hmm. with the computer code. Mm -hmm. um, I like to use their results but I don't build them. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I use only observational data. So we have some questions coming in from viewers. So someone asked, what is the design yeah. of the deep water drifters? Do you have pictures of them online anywhere? Uh, yes. Um, I think there are, if not, I can send you some, if you can put them, them up or distribute them. Um, I don't know if there are any pictures on my website. Um, I'll have okay. to check. Okay. Um, um, do you have any other? Look, yeah, go I ahead. Can, yeah, they're they're just basically a big box. Um, they're square, a big box. They're about they go up to my hip. I'm not a very tall person. I'm sitting. I know, but um, they go about <laughs> they go about to my hip, um, and they're very robust. They're very they heavy. Yellow on top. They right? are 300 pounds. Each, yes. whoa. Yes, they're yeah. very, yes, they each 300 pounds. Um, so to, we can lift them with two people, um, but to get them in and out of the water, we need a little crane to put them in and out. And once they're in the water, it's just this box that swims or floats. And then it can make itself heavy by um, pump, pumping oil into certain places. And so once it makes itself heavy, it starts sinking 
um, or coming back up. Yeah. That's a great question because, you know, a lot of our viewers, if they tuned in on Monday, they saw the drifter that Jeremy built, yeah. which is very yes. different looking. Very, very different. Yeah. Yes. My drifter has a lot of electronics on it. It's right. very expensive. It has like a little computer. So it has these tubes that are sealed and it has a whole computer in one. It has another tube with batter full of batteries, just as many batteries as you can imagine. And then another tube that has a second computer. So it has a lot of electronics on it, yeah. Yeah, the last thing you want is those batteries to run dead. Oh. Then you'll never get yeah. it back. Or, those, or that the computer, anything in there, like, yeah. So Hunter asked if you work with Noah. I personally do not work with Noah, but um, a lot of what Noah does is similar to um, what I, you know, on a larger scale, they do it on a larger scale. But personally, I have not worked with Noah in the past. But my, as a physical oceanographer, that is certainly an area that you can go into, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, and then Max asks, uh, why can't you go onto the Arctic? So I think it, people don't always uh, understand that if you're on a research boat, yeah. you don't. I, I once did a bunch of oceanographic cruises and we were right off Hawaii. We saw it for three months and we couldn't go to shore. <laughs> So when you say a cruise, it's not, you know, it's not, <laughs> we don't have free time. It's an expedition. We work 12 hours a day and then another shift takes over. And so to dock the ship and let everybody go off, that is a whole day that we are losing. And also once you're on the ship, you're in international water. So to go onto a, into a country or onto land, you have to clear customs. You have to make sure you have the right visa. So it's actually quite complicated to get off the ship. So we don't, unless we have research on land, we don't go on shore. We just stay on the ship. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, let's see. So we've got a couple more minutes and then Jill Christofferson yeah. from Florida Fish and Wildlife will be on. What else do you think um, viewers should know about being a physical oceanographer? Yeah, so I think it sounds, you know, to a lot of people, it sounds quite scary physics and the ocean, you know, people want to look at fish and and, and whales and um, algae, <laughs> but actually it's not as scary as it sounds. We do some really fun stuff. And, and one thing that kind of came up is the engineering part. So the instrumentation, I have a lot of really cool instruments that I can put in the water and they measure all these different things. They measure temperatures and salinity and, and velocities and all that stuff and playing with these instruments is actually a part of ocean, physical oceanography that's often forgotten. Um, and can go into engineering if you're interested in like building them or making them better mm -hmm. um, or you know optimizing them. And, um, so that's actually really really fun. And then the expeditions I think is a big draw towards physical oceanography. But again, you have to remember that's not all I do, unfortunately. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if somebody um, is watching this and they they're interested in becoming a physical oceanographer, what would you recommend they do? Let's say they're so in high school. As a physical, yes. So as a physical oceanographer, I use a lot of math and physics and computer code. So if you're interested in that, definitely make sure you get those classes, the math. Maybe if you can get, take some computer coding, and it doesn't have to be MATLAB. You know, it just has to be being comfortable with computers and some sort of programming language. Um, but even without that, math, physics, um, those are definitely subjects you want to concentrate on. I use, I mean, chemistry is very important and I use some of it, but it's definitely the math that is, I think, the most important part. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna yeah. sign on to Jill and say goodbye to you, but thank you so much for your time, Lena. Yeah. What computer languages, code, coding languages, do you think would, or would be the most valuable? Probably R. R. R is very universally used, you know, biology, Biologists use it, chemists use it, um, physical oceanographer use it as well. And once you know that, you can go branch out. So I think for statistics and even in other jobs, if you decide, oh, I don't want to do oceanography, mm -hmm. I think R is pretty valuable in a lot of things. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulze. It was really Bye. good to see you. Bye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Jill, are you there? I am. How yeah. are you? can't see I'm you. How are you? I am excited to be talking to some of my favorite people today. 
I'm excited to do this as well. Can you can you see me? This is my first time with this I program. I can. I like your horse picture in the background. <laughs> Thank you. I have I have two of oh, them. Oh, two. They're, yes. They're, they're Swedish doll horses. So. Jill works uh, for Florida Fish and Wildlife, and uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife has a lot of different offices, but Jill happens to work in the Florida Fish and Wildlife office that is in Jacksonville University's Marine Science Research Institute. So she also is down the hall for me. And then Jill is, she helps me out all the time. She comes to my class and she helps me with my fish dissections for intro marine bio. A lot of times she will supply the fish, um, which is I really appreciate. And she'll also talk to my class, like she's gonna talk to you guys today about what Florida Fish and Wildlife does and what her job involves. Um, so Jill, can you tell us, um, I mean, there's two things that I'm asking everyone today. One is what your job involves and two, how you got there. And then if you think that there's like a more direct route, let's say somebody at home's in high school and they would like to have your job, what you would recommend they do? Because some of us took um, more indirect paths <laughs> to get to where we are, which isn't wrong, but it might not be the first steps they should take. Fair enough. Um, okay, I'm sorry, can you say all of those questions again? Yes, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> let's start with, um, what is your day-to-day -day job like? Okay. Um, well, my day-to-day -day job looks a little bit different now than it used to six months ago. <laughs> Tell us what it was six months ago. Okay, I was going to say, that's more interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I do outreach and education for the um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Division of Marine Fisheries. And so um, what that entails is a couple different things. Um, we have a statewide um, angler recognition program called Catch a Florida Memory. And right now I'm the administrator for that program, which basically entails um, marketing for that program, um, as well as corresponding with our anglers and also approving all of the um, submissions for that program. And it's like I said, it's a statewide program, so we get a lot of submissions for that. Um, so that's a huge part of my job right now. But also um, the outreach component is interfacing with anglers um, and also school groups and pretty much talking to anyone who's interested about um, marine, our marine fisheries in Florida. And that can be anything from talking about different policy changes that we might be making to, you know, just basic science about um, our fisheries in Florida and like the life cycle or things like that. Um, I attend different things, different um, like school nights, but also um, large fishing shows the Inter, um, International Invention for Allied uh, Sport Fish Trades is an uh, international show that they have in Orlando every year. So I go to that every year with several other of my colleagues and we just talk to vendors and, and really anyone um, about the different uh, marine fisheries programs we have in Florida and stuff like that. So those are the two major components and then also getting to do fun fish dissections with college classes is another real big perk. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm blushing now. Uh, so how did you wind up with FWC? Um, uh, very, kind of a roundabout route. Um, so I did my undergrad at University of Connecticut. I'm originally from Massachusetts and, you know, grew up around marine fisheries, but it's very cold up there. Um, so I, you were a big fish, a big fisher woman, right? You fished a lot with your dad yeah. growing up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did. I did. I mean, I, you know, striped bass, bluefish are like my favorite fish because that's what we would catch up there. Um, but, you know, working outside in the winter up there is really unpleasant. Um, so I always wanted to move south. Um, and so I worked for the Forest Service um, during the summer um, in Virginia doing um, stream surveys for them. And then uh, my first real job out of college was with um, actually the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute out of Florida. What was your college um, degree? I missed it. Um, my college degree, my, my undergraduate degree is in natural resources management okay. engineering. Okay, sorry, thank you. Yeah, that's cool. Um, which I don't actually think they, they offer anymore. I think they've changed it because I don't engineer anything. <laughs> <laughs> you should never ask me to engineer anything. Um, and so I worked for them for about four years doing um, fisheries monitoring and um, pulling big nets, which is what some other people down the hall from me do and mm -hmm. the people I share an office with now. Um, and then from there, I went to work for Louisiana um, doing aquaculture outreach um, for their program, got my master's in um, natural resource economics, and then came back to Florida Fish and Wildlife um, because I really enjoyed working for them and I also just really like Florida. And I've been with the agency doing this job for about six years now. 
Wonderful. Uh, so many questions. Real quick, in <laughs> case people don't know what aquaculture is, can you explain that? Sure. So aquaculture is the uh, propagation or growing of um, marine organisms. I I'm not going to give you the technical definition. I don't even know what that is. That's okay. But, um, but, but uh, the, basically the growing in, of um, aquatic organisms in some sort of containment engineered by, by people. Right. Um, so fish like, farming. You know, um, and it, right? It could yeah, be shellfish, okay, yeah, shrimp, yeah. fin fish. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fish so, farming, fish farming, shrimp farming. Can you describe? So I think a lot of times when people think of Florida fish and wildlife, they think of you know um, maybe like p police on the river, right, in uniform and you know with the like, big belts that have like lots of gadgets on them. So can you explain the many facets of Florida fish and wildlife? Sure. I mean that that is you know the the common common thought and I, I will have lots of people ask me if I'm law enforcement to which I reply to them I cannot shoot a gun and you don't want me to because I can't hit anything <laughs> um, but we we have so many different jobs that you can do at fish and wildlife that some of them don't have anything to do with fish or wildlife like we have a whole IT team and a whole social media team and bless their hearts I would not want to do their jobs because <laughs> I manage our social media page just one of them and that's a whole other entity in itself um, but so we have, you know, like I said, people that do social media, people that do IT, we have people that manage our terrestrials, um, anything from deer, turkey, to, um, you know, our um, invasive species that manage some of, uh, when you hear the, about the python challenge, mm. um, or deal with tegus and things like that. We have people that deal with shorebirds. Did you say tegus? I did say tegus, yes. Okay, what's a tegu? <laughs> <laughs> it's an invasive, a big, scary, invasive lizard. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're actually very pretty, but people, you know, will have them as pets and then they don't want them anymore, so they let them go. And Florida is a great place because it's got a lovely climate, and when you let things go here, they tend to do really well. So, tegus are a thing. <laughs> Good to know. Um, but so we, have people, so we have people that, you know, monitor, monitor those populations and are in charge of, you know, educating people about why you should not let them go. Um, and, and, you know, or try and trap them and things like that. Um, we have shorebird people, we have sea turtle people, we have manatee people, people that, you know, will go out, um, like based up at the Jacksonville Zoo, we've got a section where um, they will, if they see a manatee in distress, they'll go out and try and capture it and help and put it in a rehab facility. Um, they'll also do necropsies um, if they find a dead manatee to see if they can figure out what the, um, what the source of death was. Um, they also have a tagging program where they'll tag the manatees just to see their movements. Um, we've also got right whale people, um, our marine fisheries monitoring people out of FWRI, our Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, and they not only do saltwater fish, we also have freshwater fish um, people. They do the shocking, which if you ever get a chance to do it is super fun and I highly encourage it. Can you explain that? Sure. So shocking, um, that's actually my first job with uh, um, the Forest Service was doing backpack shocking, but you can also shock from a boat. And what shocking is, is basically you introduce an electrical current into freshwater, it only works in freshwater, that temporarily shocks or paralyzes the fish so you can catch them and, um, you know, count, count them, measure them, and then release them. And, and typically it's not lethal. Um, it just kind of stuns them for a minute. And we had a, I, I, won't, I won't name him, but we had a guest expert on earlier this week who has a very funny fish shocking story where he had a hole in his dry suit uh, and did not oh, know yeah. it, yes. And when that happens, you become one of the fish, right? You shock yourself. Yes. yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, if you're not wearing gloves and you touch the metal part of the net, that will, uh, that will also give you a, a good wake up call. Did you learn that one the hard way? I may have. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I love about FWC is that you guys have hire people at all levels. So you have PhD yeah. st scientists, you have master scientists such as yourself. Um, I, I know you've hired some of our students straight out of undergrad. Um, yeah. And you also have internships, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, and, and it's statewide too, and pretty much whatever you're interested in, you can find an internship. Um, we'll also take volunteers. I mean, we will we will take your free labor. 
Um, absolutely. Um, and like, I got a job, I got a job with them right out of, right out of school, right out of my undergrad. Um, and then came back and wanted to advance more. So I got my master's and then came back to do that. But we do have PhD students. And just because you don't have a PhD or a master's doesn't mean you can advance. You know, our um, experiences also weight very heavily. Yeah. And, um, I mean, one of the things is, you know, you may be volunteering your time, but you're learning skills from FWC as well, which really appealing. And, you know, sometimes those volunteer positions can turn into jobs with FWC. And if not, it's at least something for your your resume. Right. Um, Absolutely. And I, I believe some uh, some people that have worked in your office came in with a BS or maybe a BA, and then um, while working at FWC, went through our marine science program at JU at the same time. So yeah. that worked really well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, we've got we've had several people that have done the program at JU and also um, U, uh, UF yeah. and, and several other things. And, um, and several, we have uh, several other colleges that we have really good working relationships. And that's actually very common, especially in FWRI, where people will start with a BS and then, you know, use some of the research that they're doing in their job yeah, to, yeah. to get their master's. That's, it's yeah. a great uh, partnership. It is, it is. Not to put you on the spot or test your memory here, can you name the um, locations in Florida where the other FWC offices are? Um, I cannot give you the FWC offices because there are entirely too many of them. I can give you the FWRI offices. Do you know how many of them there are? Yeah, um, so there's one in Apalachicola, there's one in Cedar Key, there's one in St. Petersburg, then there's Charlotte Harbor, there's Keys Lab, there's one in Tequesta, Indian River, and then Jacksonville. And those are all of the um, fisheries independent monitoring. Okay, um, location. and those are all the, the RIs, the research institutes? Um, yes, that, no, there are other smaller, like Gainesville has a freshwater FWRI. Okay. Um, and there are smaller other labs throughout the state, but those are kind of the big ones. Okay, and so I, I know you said there's too many Florida Fish and Wildlife offices to name all of those. Are those places that um, our viewers could potentially volunteer or do internships, or is it mainly the research institutes? Oh, no, they can do it. They can do them all over. We just we have people like put in every like nook and cranny of the state that I mean, I, you know, but we have we also have regional offices. And so, you know, if you don't necessarily know where, you know, they're, they're the nearest offices uh -huh. to you, you can look up the um, regional office and our state is two, three, I want to say six regions, but it, it may be I might be off on that. Um, and there's a regional office in each one and there's people typically there's a volunteer coordinator um, but there's also um, someone in each division our um, fwc is broken up into divisions and you could you know if you're interested in an internship my, your best bet would probably be to call a, um, a regional office and be, say hey i'm interested in working with you know marine turtles or something who can i talk to in our area and they can refer you to someone um, that works with that and in, in, you're about area probably okay um so if i go fishing sometimes when i'm at um the the i just lost the word where we put the boats in the water <laughs> the dock well but if you on the back of a trailer on boat your ramp? cart boat ramp Sometimes at the boat ramp, I see, oh my gosh, I need more coffee today. Sometimes I see people from FWC. All right, what are they doing? It depends on what kind of boat they're driving and what they're wearing. Um, it could be our law enforcement officers who are either launching their boat to, you know, police the river or, or you know, they go offshore as well. And they'll go offshore and police out there as well. Um, or they could be checking your fish at the boat ramp. Um, it could be our marine mammal people going out to check on a manatee or our sea turtle people doing the same thing or our right whale people. Um, if they're, it's a freshwater boat, they could be our shocking people who are going to monitor a, some freshwater area or it could be our um, marine, fisheries monitoring, marine fisheries monitoring people and they're the ones that have what I like to call the goofy boats because they've got the motor in the center of the boat rather than on the back. Um, and that allows them to set the gears off the back of the boat. Um, and so they're kind of a, a distinct um, group and they say marine research on the side and they're the ones who do the marine fisheries monitoring. Can you tell us what you mean by the gears off the back of the boat? 
Sure. So they have three different gears that they set, um, typically. Um, and one is a um, 6.1 meter otter trawl. And that is um, something they deploy off the back of the boat. And that is um, geared towards catching juvenile fish, so really, really tiny, tiny things. Um, then we have a um, small, uh, small seine as well that we, again, are geared toward the smaller, um, smaller juvenile fish. And then we also have a 600 foot seine net that is deployed literally off the back of the boat. The, the boat goes forward, the, the net is paid out the back. Um, and that is uh, geared more towards adult and sub-adult species. And that one is a joy to breathe, pull in because it's uh, pulled in exclusively by hand. Ooh, and it, so it's heavy, it's hard to pull it in? It, it, it's very heavy. Um, there's two people on either side and um, I did that job for about four years and I was in amazing physical shape because you get some pretty big guns doing that one. <laughs> so I bet when you're doing that job, I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to be pretty hardy, right? I mean, I, Florida doesn't get frigid like Massachusetts, but it there are some chilly days out there where it gets below freezing and you don't get to say, yeah we're not going out today, right? You have to go out when you have to go out. And then on the other hand, it gets boiling hot, right? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, we're not quite the postal service, but we will sickle in rain. We will be chased off the water by rainstorms, by thunder and lightning. And, you know, you kind of have to make sure that you're aware of what the weather's doing so that you can get off the water in time to make sure that you're not, you know, smack in the middle of the ocean when you get a thunder and lightning storm. But you know, also I've sampled when we had to scrape ice off the boat. Um, it's been a while, but that, that is something. And then, I mean, you know, middle of the summer in Florida, the water is not always refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it'll be a hundred degrees, you know, on the boat and then you get in the water and it's 80 and you're like, well, this isn't really doing anything for me. Um, so you have to be able to work in all environments, um, you know, climates, but also the, the actual terrain that you're working in is not always those beautiful, pristine sand beaches. You know, you're pulling those large nets sometimes in mud up to your thigh, or, you know, you're jumping into sawgrass that can be over Ooh. your head and, you know, Ouch. tromping through that. Um, and, you know, you're not always wearing waders because it's you know, 100 degrees out. So um, it's, it's it, you know, you have to you have to know what you're doing, but it, I mean, the work is so cool and you get to see some places too that normal people don't get to see, which is, is really kind of part of the sell of the job. So let's say you, you've been out pulling gear, all right? And then you mm -hmm. bring those fish back to the lab. What I typically see you guys do, you're, you're usually either standing around a metal table that has like a sink at the end, or I see yes. a fair number of people, of course, there's always people on computers, but I also see a fair number of people on microscopes. And I feel like when yeah. my students go to volunteer with you guys, usually they get the microscope work first. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about what what's happening at the metal table with the sink and what's happening on the microscopes? Sure, so with the metal, ta the metal table with the sink, that's typically where we're taking some of our sub-adult fish, the, the larger fish, and we're taking those back for samples. So what we'll typically do with them is take out the otoliths or the ear stones. I happen to have some right here because I'm that person that takes them. And these are, oh, those are gas okay, let's see. Ah, here we go. These are actually, if you can see them, those are from a spotted sea trout. Very cool, um, yeah. There you go. Um, and so what those are, um, those are the ear stones and we use those to age the fish. What they'll do with those is slice them very thin and look at them under a light microscope. And then um, they'll actually have r uh, rings like uh, tree trunk rings that you can use to age the fish. So that'll give us um, an idea of kind of our population because we'll have the length and the weight of the fish and combine with the age. Um, we'll also take mercury samples um, to get an idea of mercury in some of those um, higher trophic level fish. And then and we also sometimes will look at stomach contents and also the gonads to see if the fish are able to spawn at that age. Mm. Um, so again, kind of gives us some information on the population. Mm -hmm. And then um, when at, we're at the microscope, um, what we're typically doing is so when we're out in the field, we'll take some fish back for a represent what we call a rep or representative sample. And that's to make sure that what we're identifying the fish as is the field in the field is actually what we think they are. Um, and so that, you know, kind of helps us get an idea because we'll see, you know, a couple thousand fish in a day and we can't take all of those back mm -hmm. because, you know, we want to leave the fish yeah. in the environment. So we'll take, um, it's typically three, um, three per gear type. 
And um, that just helps us make sure that we're, you know, um, catching what we think we're catching. And then we'll also take some back for identification if maybe it's a fish that's very hard to identify in the field or um, something that we've never seen before. And that's, um, that's happened before or, or a fish that maybe isn't supposed to be here. Like I think one time we caught a juvenile red snapper in the mouth of the St. John's and that it's very, very rare. And Where so should they be? Back. Further offshore. Okay. Um, it was it was a hurricane year, so there was a bunch of fun stuff going oh, on there. Um, but typically, that's a little too a little too fresh for them. So um, that was interesting. Do you mind answering a couple questions from our viewers? Sure, I'd be happy to. Or uh, do my best anyway. Okay. Um, one person wants to know: Have you ever found a bull shark in the river? I have not not in this river, but I know that they're there. <laughs> in 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 the St. John's River. They can, I mean, they, they can come so far into fresh water. I, I'm sure they're there. You guys catch bonnet heads from time to time, correct? We catch, we commonly catch bonnet heads, um, Atlantic sharp nose. Um, and I know I've seen black tips, spinners, and um, fine tooth as well. Spinners are pretty awesome. Uh, well, I mean, they're all great. But um, uh, someone else says that in Florida, do you, oh, it's a question. In Florida, do you need to have a license to go fishing? <laughs> I love that question. Um, the, that is a multi-tiered answer. Give us so all the answers. If you, I will give you all the answers. So if you are um, under 16, you do not need a license. If you are over 65, you do not need a license. Oh. If you are fishing from shore, you do need a license, but it is a free license. Um, but you still have to have it. And it, it, if you go to somewhere like Academy, it ends up being like a dollar eighty in processing fees. Um, if you're going to be fishing from a boat or somewhere that um, you need to swim to get there, then you need to buy the free, the full license. Um, and that is, uh, I think, $15. And this is another commonly asked question is how do you know whether you need a saltwater or freshwater license? Mm. And that is, um, that on the species that you're targeting. So St. John's is brackish, so you get a lot of both. If you have a saltwater license, you can only really keep those saltwater species. Now, because it's brackish, if you catch a largemouth bass, you gotta let it go. If you have the saltwater. If you, yeah, if you have the, if you have only a saltwater license. If you have both, you know, just as long as you're following the regulations, you're good. And then you can buy one license that covers everything, including lobsters, right? For a year, is yeah. that? Are they 60? Yeah. Do you remember how much they cost? Um, so it's, I want to say it's about 35 if you get the, the two together. And then I've never actually bought the- Two to, um, you mean saltwater and freshwater? Is only 35? Yeah, it's only like 35. Huh. Cause it's, I think 15 for each. Um, it, might, it might be a little bit more than that. Um, and then you have to get a special lobster um, endorsement if you're going to go lobster fishing. Or if you're going to harvest lobsters. We got a couple more questions. Um, someone sure. wants to know: Have you have you seen any sea turtles caught in freshwater grasses? Sea turtles caught in freshwater grasses. I'm not sure exactly what they mean. I have seen. I have seen, and this is going back to my Appalachian. I'm assuming we're talking about freshwater sea grasses on the bottom. I have never seen that. So sea turtles normally thing. stick to salt water, so they probably wouldn't typically be in fresh it, where sea grasses would freshly yeah, water sea grasses. Yeah, typically. Now I've seen them. I've seen them during a cold sun event where they'll get stuck in some of the marsh grass because they're not able to move, so they get like stuck in the marsh grass when the tide goes out. Oh. Um, but I've not seen them entangled in a, a freshwater grass situation. Then we have a question about, do you go in deep water? And so the people that work on the right whales and some of those species go in deep water, but Jill, you don't typically go in deep water, do you? Um, actually. You do? Uh, I, um, we have um, some really great offshore cruises as well that we do for offshore monitoring, like CMAP, we used to do the bait fish cruise, and then we would also do some um, traps and cameras, um, deep water cruises, looking for a grouper and snapper. And so I've got to participate in a lot of a lot of those back in the day. And it's very interesting to not see land anywhere around you for several days. <laughs> it's a whole other level. The first time it's a little trippy, but yes, we do, we do go in some very deep water. Gotcha. And what, so what, 
the vessels that I've seen that are at JU for FWC aren't ones that you could spend the night out no. in the ocean. Where no. are those vessels kept? Um, so typically we contract out, we do have a couple uh, vessels in St. Pete. Um, I don't know if they still have the one that I went on, but the, the really larger vessels we contact out, we contract out um, and uh, a couple with uh, UCF, the Weather Bowl, and I think the Bellows has been retired. Um, University of Georgia has one. And then um, there's another one in, I want to say it's University of Mississippi, but I'm not sure. But I know that the other one that we go on is um, housed out of Biloxi. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the big that's one. Right. Excellent. Well, is there anything else that you would like to share with our viewers about FWC or getting involved or your job or? Um, gosh, I, I, I want to emphasize that FWC really has something for everyone. And even if you are interested in something that you're not sure how it relates to wildlife, but you think you'd like to do it, there's probably a niche for you in there somewhere. Um, and I also really can't undersell the value of experience. Um, because, you know, there, there are some parts of this job that aren't always super fun. And so someone who has a lot of schooling but has never actually been in the field at all is sometimes someone that might, we might be a little bit hesitant to hire just because they might not have a, a full appreciation for all the things that the job entails. Mm -hmm. And once they get out there, you know, they might find, oh, you know, I'm not a field work person. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Lab people are amazingly useful as well, and you know we need both. But um, I, again, I really can't undersell that, um, oversell the the importance of experience, and, and even in a, a a summer internship, something that you can say, oh, okay, they've, they 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 kind of know what they're doing. And and I will also say that the most valuable experience I gained was actually on field training in my first job. My my college classes were very useful. But I mean, that, that learning curve on your first job is, there's nothing like it. <laughs> and so if people want to volunteer or find an internship, should they just reach out to their local FWC office? Um, that is one way to do it. We also typically, and I don't have the website in front of me, but we used to, and I'm sure that we still do have a, um, a website that lists all of our um, internship opportunities. Okay. They're somewhat limited now due to current events, right. but I would anticipate that they would um, pick that pick back up. And and you know there, there's a learning curve for us too. And find, excuse me, finding ways to adapt them to to work in our, our current situation. And then for jobs like career positions, are those on FWC website or jobs.gov? It's, it's um, People's First. People's it's uh, Florida.People's First, and that has all of the Florida state jobs. So not just FWC, but also Department of Aquaculture and DEP. My wonderful uh, volunteer, Alex uh, Wilson over here, just posted the link for uh, my fwc.com get involved. So that yes, is now perfect. available. All right, Jill, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I miss you. It's been fun talking to you again. You too. I'm sorry, I don't have any unicorns here to really spruce the place up. I apologize. Jill <laughs> loves unicorns. I can always suck her in with a good unicorn. All right, Jill, uh, stay well. Thank you so much. You too. Thanks so much. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, so that wraps up our morning session. Go get some lunch, and then um, we will be rejoining you at 1 o'clock with some guests from Crowley to talk about um, what they do for Jacksonville uh, and shipping in our city. Have a good time.